Bring on the Mountaineer, the official battle cry of West Virginia football. For 100 years, the Mountaineers have charged onto the fields of battle and into the hearts of the West Virginia people. He opening up the Middle East to the 20, the 25, he's racing. Swings out to the right, cuts down on the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. If you're supposed to be an arrow in that ball cap, you get there. Football team is ever ready to play a game. It's you. And let's understand the fourth quarter will decide this football game. Touchdown, West Virginia! Touchdown, West Virginia! Touchdown! West Virginia, a touchdown West Virginia. Men of might and moments of majesty. It has been a century-long call to glory. Bring on the Mountaineers. 100 years of West Virginia football. Almost heaven, the rugged beauty that is West Virginia. Massive mountains and peaceful valleys surround the small towns and villages of this proud state. This is home to a people who have held on to the values of their forefathers. Generations known for their fierce loyalties and hardworking lifestyles. Attitudes which are reflected in the spirit of the West Virginia University Mountaineers. The university's football team is really the state's football team. I think that's one of the lessons you learn uh, when you're associated with the university is that people, a lot of people in every corner of the state um, have that flying WV on their truck or their car. That's, that's their link um, in many ways to the university. They love the Mountaineers. It, uh, it's a relationship that starts when, when they're very young, I think, because they grow up uh, worshiping the Mountaineers and the Mountaineer players, and uh, they keep that loyalty over the years. And that, that does say something very positive about the people in this state. I think when the state was going through some very difficult times, football would kind of bring a little bit of spirit and pride to the people of West Virginia. And it made us proud that when we'd go back to our little hometowns. I was from a little town called Wellsburg, West Virginia. And the sense of pride that people would take there, I mean, the paper mills had closed down, the steel mills weren't working that well in those days. And when I went back, it seemed like it was a very joyous occasion. People had taken a sense of pride. I mean, the, from the Elks Club to the American Legion to the little clubs that kids very, very seldom hear about today. I mean, you, you know, you were like a local hero. Small town heroes who grew up dreaming of one day wearing the golden blue, playing for their home state, being called a mountaineer. I came from Moundsville, West Virginia. Couldn't wait to put on a golden blue football uniform here at West Virginia University. You know, West Virginia people really stick together and they have a uniqueness about themselves. And when they get a cause in front of them and put their shoulders together, they're gonna to accomplish that. And they take a lot of pride in what they uh, do. And one of the things they take a lot of pride in is that football team they put out on that field. The people in this state are a little different. Uh, they've worked hard to make a living. Some of them have uh, been bounced around a little bit with the tough situation of steel and coal but they've always come out clawing and scratching. And I like to think that our football team has come out clawing and scratching. And our football team identifies with the people in this state. Uh, we know the people love us and we love them. It's a special feeling. It has been a century long love affair between the Mountain State and its home team. For 100 years, the pride of the people of West Virginia has come alive in Mountaineer football. The story begins 100 years ago in 1891. As legend has it, proceeds from this university production of Shakespeare's Richard III helped finance the school's first football team. 
After converting a cow pasture into a makeshift gridiron, the Mountaineers lost their first contest to Washington and Jefferson by the score of 72 to nothing. It was a rocky start on the Mountaineers' road to glory. 1915 marked the arrival of West Virginia's first consensus football All-American, Ira Eret Rogers. Rogers was a magnificent all-round athlete. In his senior year, he was captain of the baseball, basketball, and football team. Teammate Paul Hager remembers the brilliant Rogers. He was the greatest athlete ever in West Virginia. He could pass, he could kick. In the, in the Princeton game, why Rogers threw the, told the Ann, go down there and just center the goal line, and I'll throw the pass to him. And Rogers threw him a pass for about 50 yards, and he caught it for a touchdown. Rogers' performance against that powerful Princeton team in 1919 helped spark the Mountaineers to a stunning 25-0 victory and secured his name on Walter Camp's All-American team. To this day, Rogers still holds nine Mountaineer scoring records. He would go on to coach at West Virginia for nine seasons, but the brilliant Eric Rogers will always be remembered as one of the greatest athletes to ever play the game. New head coach Clarence Spears arrived in Morgantown in 1921 and systematically put together a program which is referred to today as the first golden era of West Virginia football. Under Spears, the mighty squad of 1922 went undefeated, winning 10 games and tying one, including a 21-13 victory over Gonzaga in the Mountaineers' first ever postseason bowl game, the East-West Bowl in San Diego. The winning ways continued under Spears, sparking the construction of a new stadium along Beechurst Avenue down by the Mon River. Mountaineer Field officially opened in 1924, becoming the home of a program which was steadily growing in national scope and prominence. With the tougher schedules, though, came some tougher times for Mountaineer teams. Then in 1937, Former Mountaineer team captain Marshall Little Sleepy Glenn took over as coach and led West Virginia to an 8-1 and 1 record and a dazzling 7-6 upset of Texas Tech in the 1938 Sun Bowl. West Virginia would return to the Sun Bowl to face another Texas opponent following the 1948 season. Under head coach Dud DeGroote, the Mountaineers went 9-3 and, and earned their second trip to El Paso. Number 12 quarterback Jimmy Walthall led the way in a come-from-behind victory against Texas Western. However, a disappointing 4-6-1 record in 1949 led to the resignation of DeGroot as head coach. The following spring, the ball was passed to Art Lewis, and there were few in the Mountain State who could predict what lay ahead for the Mountaineers. Art Pappy Lewis moved back to West Virginia in 1950 to take over the coaching job he said he had always wanted. A shrewd judge of talent, Lewis used both his grand style as well as his fondness for down-home cooking to recruit the quality players that would carry West Virginia all the way to the Sugar Bowl. He was a grand person. He was the kind of a person that walked into the house and his, your mother and dad, especially the mother, he went straight to the kitchen, sat down at the kitchen table and he uh, looked in the pot and see, to see what was there to eat. And it, I often said that the, it didn't make any difference where you might want to go to school. If you had a choice, why it was over because he was such a friend of the parents. He was the next thing to a father to most of us. And he was a great recruiter. The one thing you didn't want to do was you didn't want to get in trouble with Pappy because when he called you in his office, you knew you were in trouble and he either straightened you out or the troublemakers sort of left the university. 
He was a big old guy, he looked like a, a lot like John L. Lewis, big old bushy eyebrows, and, and uh, I guess Pap was about 250 pounds, which was big for a coach at that time, and he was one of the biggest guys I'd ever seen, and, and he had a big old uh, roar about him, and he just, uh, he, you knew that he was the boss, and uh, he, ran, he ran his football team, and you were his boys, and, and that team was his family. It just